agenda and if there's any additions to the agenda feel free to share i would ask that we please remove 12.2 i had some information in a meeting today that um, i just need to edit that document again so i will um reshare it with you once i've made the edits to it so we'll just remove 12.2 please okay that sounds good um so now we can do the approval of minutes uh a mover uh, Matt and seconder Becky and in advance I'll say my apologies if I do not call on you but um, it's just whoever I catch first on the screen so I appreciate that any declarations of pecuniary interest oh all in favor there we go <laughs> thank you Rebecca <laughs> Uh, any declarations of pecuniary interest? No? Okay, we'll move on to number four. Uh, approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, they were included in the package, so I'm hoping that you had an opportunity to read them. Um, any questions or comments to the minutes from the last meeting? And thank you again, Sarah's doing a wonderful job with, them, with the minutes, and I appreciate it tremendously. I'll move that the minutes be adopted. Excellent. Matt and seconder? I'll second it. That's John. All in favor? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and is there any business arising from the minutes? Not for tonight's agenda, no. No. Um, the only thing I initially had, but Terrence is not on, I was really keen to hear about his me Souls meeting on uh, September 24th. But we can always do that another time. That would be no problem. So, um, so we'll move on to number six, which is actually oh, Terrence is here, I believe. So maybe I'll ask him if he's if if you folks are okay. I'll just ask him if he would be um, receptive to maybe giving us um, some information. Oh, oh, there we go. Hi, Terrence. Oh, he's gone. Hi, Terrence. Welcome. Hi, how are you? You must have known that I was just talking about you. I noticed at the last minutes that you were going to go to a souls meeting um, on September 24th. And I was hoping that maybe you could give us a brief uh, rundown of that, maybe a bit later. Well, I'm also going to the follow up meeting on November 7th. So. I have um, that meeting as well. So, um, but I I will give you a brief outline of I was only it was all day long, <laughs> it went for six hours. So I didn't stay on it for the full six hours. <laughs> Understandable. So maybe we'll add that on to um, other business for number twelve. Is that all right? Okay, excellent. Um, Rebecca, is there any correspondence that we need to deal with? No, I have no correspondence. Okay. Financial reports, uh, reports. We will go through the accounts payable. Um, as per usual, I'll, I would recommend that we just do it as a collective. Um, any comments or observations in terms of the accounts payable? No. Um, so can I have a mover to have it? Uh, I did have one question. Sure. My apologies. Go ahead, Terrence. Um, there was one item for thirty-four thousand three hundred and sixty dollars for um, uh, the. Uh, it was f to Stratford Public Library, and I was just wondering what. I realize that's our membership. What does that cover? I was yep. just curious. Yeah, I'll try and run through it off the top of my head, but there is a complicated um, spreadsheet that was created by a consultant a few years back. Um, 
as we were joining PCIN. So that would have been around 2012. And and certain indicators get fed into it, um, like our um, our annual circulation, the number of Horizon licenses that we use. So our daily software that we use is called Horizon. Um, and certain pieces of the budget are all divided you know, we've decided, you know, certain things get divided equally, certain things get divided by usage or by population or all those things. So it covers, um, for North Perth, it covers our Horizon licenses for all of our locations. And we do have more licenses than most libraries because we have a lot of location, a lot, three compared to one um, locations. We do not use um, IT, whereas some of the libraries use the IT support of PCIN, so that's not included for North Perth, whereas others pay for that. But we are charged back um, if the Strat for Public Library staff have to use uh, or are used for Horizon-related issues. So, like, if we make a change and, and need help getting through their firewall or those kinds of things, those are, are billed back. But it's on a rolling average, so it's not, you know, it, it's not unpredictable. They they predicted ahead of time. Um, what else? Our Collection HQ software gets billed through PCIN's budget. Actually, the van usage, even though we host the van, the van money all goes into one pot, and then North Perth will bill back um, okay. what we need to. So that, that goes in there. Um, I can't think of the rest of it. But it's it's agreed upon and approved by the PCIN board. Uh, in advance so and it's always spot on what we had budgeted for for the year and then um, oh, also capital reserve for future replacement of the daily software the ILS that we use that gets included in that budget capital reserve for um, well the van is separate the capital reserve for the van is separate in our budget lines but so it's the entirety of PCIN for a year. So our download library licenses, all of that all just goes into one budget and we get one bill um, at the end of the year for those services. That's fine. I just was curious if it involved a van. Yeah. That's what I was uh, wondering about because it, it's a large amount and that's why I was curious. So thank you. Good question. Yeah. You're welcome. And thanks Rebecca for your response. Are there any other comments, questions? <clears throat> If not, um, could I have a mover and a seconder to accept the uh, accounts payable that were presented for this meeting? Um, I'll make that motion. Um, who was the I? Sorry. Me, Leanne. Oh, Leanne. And a seconder would be Becky. Um, all in favor? Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, our next item would be the capital budget for 2021. I'll hand this over to Rebecca. Thank you. So for the council members who are there, uh, please feel free to speak up if I'm not um, encapsulating it properly in my one sentence. But council's budget visioning session has been held for 2021. And the overall theme of it was basically to focus on a lean 2021, focus on what's necessary, focus on what can actually be done, um, and also focus on cleaning up some of the continual carry forwards that we keep um, running into. And this year for the library, we've done pretty well on resolving some of the carry forwards that we have had. Um, for example, I'm told the Atwood sewer hookup is going to happen by the end of October, and that's when we've been carried, carrying forward for a very, very long time. Um, so we will get pretty close to cleaning up some of our our projects. And then the, I only have two to be carried forward into 2021, keeping in mind that the library in Atwood and the EMCC project falls under the parks and recreation budget. So that project, in terms of um, forwarding the design further and doing community consultation, that will roll through the parks and rec budget, I've been told. And so what we are rolling forward is again, still just remedial masonry <laughs> repairs um, for the Listowel Library, because we still don't 100% know what the plan is for the hub and for that building, but we still need to do things like put those little roofs on the on the rotary park piers on the pergola so it doesn't continue to disintegrate. Um, I can't speak to why it wasn't done in the in the time that I wasn't here, but my sense of what's happened at 
up to this point is just capacity to complete the work on the staff that we have. So I am still in the remaining months that we have, especially now that Moncton has is on its way to, to wrapping up. Um, I am still going to push to try and get as much of that done before the end of this fiscal year. And then what if we need to carry anything forward, that obviously the, the dollar figure for that amount will adjust accordingly if we need to carry anything forward. I'm a, I don't know. I, I can't predict. But um, I will ask if we have the capacity internally or if I need to hire that out before the end of the year. And then the second project is the uh, Listwell Library and North Perth Community Hub design, cont continuing of the design. Um, I have been in communication with the United Way. They are exploring a bunch of different options in terms of how to uh, have that project funded, uh, thinking creatively in terms of how we could make this project go forward. And those things would all come to... Um, to council or to the library board as appropriate. We're not just gonna go off and decide we're gonna build this hub without the appropriate approvals. But what we can do and what we have the approval for already is to just continue to refine the design. Uh, we have learned through, we have recently had a meeting where the the hub tenants who had already said they were interested were asked to re-verify if they were interested or if COVID had changed things for them or their organization. They all still are interested, albeit there might be a couple little tweaks that they would make to their requests. Um, we also asked about what <coughs> they had learned from COVID that um, we could adapt into the design so that if something similar happened in the future, they would be able to remain more operational than they perhaps were while they were in these current circumstances. So I am having a conversation tomorrow, actually, with the architects who helped us with the design for the um, grant application to see if they will provide us with a quote for uh, redesign and a consultation with the user, like the the tenants to see what it what design kind of challenges they may need incorporated. One of the anchor tenants actually has discovered they actually need more space. Um, so we uh, so taking all of that into consideration into a re, um, a revamped design. So we may indeed still spend some of this money before the end of 2020. But um, so tonight, what I'm asking for is permission to include any carry forward that there would be in the 2021 uh, capital budget. So that's basically a recap of all that we have. That's actually plenty when you think about it, um, the work for the hub and the work for the EMCC um, to continue rolling those forward. So what I'm looking for tonight is just a motion that the board approves forwarding those proposed capital budgets or capital projects to council for their consideration in the process. And of course, I'll answer any questions. Are there any questions regarding what Rebecca has just outlined for us? Uh, comments? Um, uh, Leanne? Yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. So, so just for, for my own clarification, because this is coming going to come to our table. Um, so basically, you're, it's really nothing new, right? Like there's no, no nothing new other than just kind of projects that have been on the table. And even though the um, the hub project, it is it is kind of new because it isn't really you know up and running yet. But that is that's something just to keep going, moving forward with it, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the exact same dollar amounts that were requested in the 2020 capital budget for these projects. So it's not, yeah. um, the amounts haven't changed, the description hasn't changed. Um, so in terms of prior commitment of council, it should just, I mean, council can always have a discussion, but it shouldn't yeah. be a surprise yeah. around council's table. Okay, good, thanks. Um, the other question I have is in the, I'm just looking at all the attachments and I'm looking for the repairs to the Listowel Library. Is it not in the Dropbox package? Is that what you're... Yeah, I'm just trying to find it, and I might be just missing it. I'm just going to see here. Is that the Listowel Library masonry repairs? Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. 19,000. That was 7.2. 7.2. 7 thank you, guys. That's great. Thank you. And you said it's around 17? 19. 19. 19. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Welcome. Is there anyone that would have any other questions or comments for Rebecca on, on um, these items? If not, is there someone who would like to make the motion to have these projects move forward um, and be presented to council? Uh, Terrence, was that a, okay? Yes. Move. Excellent, thank you. And is there a seconder for that? Matt, uh, all in favor? Excellent, great, sounds good. Thank you. Great, Rebecca, I'm glad. It's still moving forward, <clears throat> steadily moving forward, and that's all we ask. That's right. Which is good. Um, Becky, I know I'm being a touch optimistic, but uh, friends report. Yeah, uh, everyone can hear me okay? I'm sorry? Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yes. Okay, so I actually did speak with Christine Evo today. She called me about something for work, so she they're remaining optimistic that they'll be able to have the UCAT, but she really isn't sure. They're having someone from the, I believe she called it the, like a Christmas tree growers association. <laughs> it's supposed to, a representative is supposed to come out to them and um, meet with them and give them some input as to what's going on. So. Okay. Sorry, is that okay? Oh, that's better, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll start again. So I talked to Christine today and they're having someone from the Christmas Tree Growers Association come to their house um, in the next couple of weeks to kind of give them uh, guidelines as to what could happen. Um, and of course, they're kind of at the mercy of what the government, the reg regulations and restrictions of the government. So um, it, yeah, it, everything's up in the air. They They do want to do something if they're able to do something with us, but it may come down to um, if they're only allowed 25 people on the farm at one time, then right. they may only be able to have um, like one of us from the library board there because, you know, we don't want four of us standing there if it takes up customers space, I guess, if you want to say. Right. Um, they're not sure about the wagon rides because it could be that it's one family at a time. And once they take a family back, then they have to disinfect the wagon, which seems crazy, but... So it, they may not do a wagon ride. They're not sure. It may just be behind the barn, which is what they did a lot of last year. Um, there won't be any like apple cider. There will be no Santa um, in their store area because of the size. They may only be able to have like two people in there at one time. Right. Wow. So they really don't know. There's a lot kind of up in the air. So she's going to let me know, of course, because um, I want my son to come out and help do some tree cutting because they have orders already like from Canadian Tire and different things like that. They have orders already that they have to fill but as far as the U cut, they're not really sure. So we're hopeful something can be done but it's up in the air right now. So I just said I'd let everybody know that and then she'll keep me informed, so. Mm -hmm. Tell them that we really appreciate them even yeah. considering it. I really feel for the farmers having to, um, especially um, something like this, that there's so many variances that they have to deal with and this is their livelihood. So yeah, really yeah. want to wish them well, I think on behalf of- Yeah, the yeah. Board. yeah, I told her, I said, whatever has to happen, has to happen. Like if it's, if it's not feasible for them to do it, if it's going to take up, I don't know, you know, too much, I don't want to say too much effort. That's not what I'm saying, but- mm -hmm you know they'll they'll consider it for sure so she said if tim had his way he'd do it because he just for some people it hasn't affected them a great deal <laughs> but they still have to follow guidelines so anyway i'll keep i'll let you know great thank you mm -hmm. any questions from anyone or um anyone want uh, some more input in terms of the life the uh christmas project no Okay, now we'll move to number nine, which is board development. Didn't have anything for this agenda. Okay, that sounds fine. Uh, new business. Same deal, still working on old business. <laughs> okay. 
Any comments about Beyond the Pandemic Library's look at toward a new era with the New York Times? I just thought this was a timely article. Um, I generally don't spend too much time trolling for articles to share with the board. If they come across my desk, then great. Um, but this one had a few points that I really thought, even though it's speaking to American libraries and libraries who operate on a much bigger scale, there was quite a bit in the article that just explained some of the things that we are dealing with. And one of them being, you know, how to furnish your library and how the pandemic has brought library trends quite a ways backward in terms of what the furniture is, you know, what has to be done to a space. And, you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, we were going in a way where nobody had a service desk. And now we, we need to be able to protect our staff behind something or we're trying to offer that ability. So those of us who didn't quite catch up are, are a little bit ahead when it comes to, to that piece of it. Um, I also just thought that, they, like it mentions about curbside being in perhaps a norm going forward or an expectation of the customers after the amount of time that we will be offering curbside as an option. It'll be interesting to see if we ever are in the position where we can have the choice to remove that, how that will go with our customers. And and I, I could see in our in our. Um, municipality that perhaps one community really likes this way and another community really likes a different way. So that will be interesting to see how how it goes. And then just trying to predict future trends. What I liked about it is that community and social services are all still part of the trend, the need for libraries to be present for job hunters and, and connecting with technology is all still part of it. So it 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 still validates the needs for the hub and for the services that we tried to start with. We tried to start with things that focused on economic recovery in our community. So getting the computers up as soon as possible was one of our highest priorities. So I just thought it was a nice, timely article. Happy to discuss any piece of it with, with you, um, but just really thought it was a good encapsulation of where a lot of library CEOs' brains are right now. Yeah, I agree with you, Rebecca. That's the part that really resonated with me as well was the uh, having the tech needs um, to be able to address job seekers. Also people that um, I think the uh, working from home or working from a different space is going to be um, ongoing and will probably be permanent um, in, in some cases. And with how the demographics are changing in Listowel, I think that will impact um, gradually in the longer term, the users that will be accessing our library and the space that we'll live, that they'll need. And also that also means the furniture, which after having gone to library conferences, I have discovered is extremely expensive, but well worth it, but you, because you need something that's durable and designed for libraries but it's it's not like we can go to IKEA to pick something up for a library that just in the long term that just doesn't work. So those parts really resonated. That part really resonated with me. I thought it was interesting. The uh, the uh, was it the lawsuit? I can't remember when I read the article or the battle. I'll say with the publishers in terms of the pricing of uh, ebooks. I, I, an interesting development there. I thought and uh, one that could carry over into Canada, depending upon what direction it takes or how it ends up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's highly political, for sure, the access to e-resources and how libraries are treated, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Leanne, you looked like you had a comment. Oh, you're on. You're muted, Leanne. Oh, there we go. Great. Sorry. I, I can add to a bit of the discussion. Um, we, uh, I'm involved, of course, with as a school principal, and um, the health and safety rules at schools um, require a lot of changes with library services in our schools. And um, unfortunately, the children are not allowed to take any books home, and that's um, that's board wide in Waterloo, and uh, it's very disappointing because we know that. Uh, reading at home is very, very helpful for extending the learning. And um, that supplementary reading 
builds that ongoing ability and, and love for reading and just helps with skill level, right? So um, Nelson Publishing in Canada is, has created a, um, a whole e-reading type of site for us. And I just approved the, you know, I just took our budget and approved it. It was $2,600 for our school for kindergarten to about grade three. And these are for what they call like a benchmark collection of, of books where children will gradually work through different levels to increase their reading ability. It is different than library. I, I totally uh, understand that, but it's a way for us to you know, slowly work on reading with our kids. And um, in working with the publishers, it feels and sounds and, and this direction just seems to be moving towards much more e e-learning, e-resources, and that um, e-learning is not going to be going away at any time soon. They think even beyond the pandemic, um, we've created a whole new branch of education, and that is with, you know, e-learning, electronic learning, which will impact library services too. So um, just it's, a uh, we've learned, we're learning so much in this new new norm and um, I, we're purchasing resources in very different ways than we thought we'd ever would. So um, yeah, interesting. Any sense, Leanne, in your role there of, of what say the boards are thinking in terms of uh, virtual libraries for the schools? Do, do you sense that there is a, um, maybe it's a little premature to ask this because you know, we're still learning with with the pandemic, but do you, do, you, do you sense that there would be a movement towards virtual libraries in the schools uh, before anything, be, before say a, a standard public library? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we already have virtual libraries in Waterloo. We have one that's um, homegrown that our board has created and it hooks into other services too. And if anything, we're expecting to see that grow as well. Um, we were a bit of a standstill because so much is changing so quickly that we haven't had a lot of time to focus on library services in schools, but I think um, that is going to, you know, become more on our plate as time goes on and um, for more consideration on how do we invest into it and how do we train our kids how to use it, how do we get staff to use it because it could be our only way to access materials to extend that reading, to extend that learning for our kids. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a wave of the future that's not gonna go away. Yeah. Thanks. To me, that does raise the question of um, equity um, for families that may not have the financial resources for, um, well, internet for that matter, much less the tools for the children. Or you also look at the capabilities of the parents, whether they have that skill set. The other thing too is that we do in our particular area have a segment of the population that may not use um, e-materials e or, or technology and that sort of thing. So that I think is something that we're going to have to factor in Mm -hmm. Actually, I can speak to that, um, Bernice. What their what our provincial government is now doing is that we're required as a school to outfit every family with a computer. So um, you know, almost daily, I get um, requests for a Chromebook to be allocated to a family that's using e-learning or doing e-learning away from school. And we are required to give them those tools. And some kids who can't access internet are given those, um, the library sends them out. Rebecca will know what I speak about. Yeah. 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 So those are available to, as well for families to sign out. And they sign them out for a year and then they're to return them back to the school. And we are required to make sure that those kids at home are outfitted with all that equipment before we outfit kids at school. So in some ways, the kids at home are at a higher advantage than the ones at school because I don't have enough equipment at school because I've given it all away, basically. So our, we're taking our whole entire budget now, and we talk about budget for... Um, for, you know, our municipality, and that we're really having to look at 
um, what do we really need, you know, in our school system? And um, right now, I need tech. I absolutely need tech. I don't need a lot of other things right now. I don't need paper. I don't need glue. I don't need scissors. And we're uh, reallocating our money for that purpose so that um, we have those tools for the, our kids to use. And our goal is to have one-to-one -one technology. Um, we're at about one-to-two right now, mm -hmm. um, but we're really working towards that one-to-one. -one. So, but that's, again, that's, an, that's the wave that's gonna happen. I predict down the road, all children will have very soon their own equipment on their own desk and equipment to take home. So yeah, it's not far away. See me to me that says that um, that and I know we've just, when we did the strategic plan whenever that was the big thing was partnerships that was something um, and developing relationships and that sort of thing so um, it's, it, to me it sounds like let's say if if a Chromebook or something is given to a child if they are also aware that they can borrow from the North Perth Public Library like for instance in in our community. Um, I mean, that would be great because that, that's something that if they do have the technology, they, that awareness is already there with the, tech, with the technology when they get it. Rebecca, I think you were going to say something earlier. I'm just nodding along, but to, uh, I think this is going to be for our community one of those, those uh, times when because of this, this trend, making sure that connectivity in every community is appropriate so that the devices work. Um, we are, because we're in the midst of switching things over for Moncton, I've been using, or we've been using one of the hotspots to run the old Moncton library while our routers and everything get uh, moved over to the new location. And the router or the hotspot is great, except for if a massive truck drives by, you lose all connection. And you know, in Moncton, how often a massive truck drives by on, on Highway 23. So I've been thinking about those families who have like, this is still in a, in a, in a, in a community in terms of a, like a high density of a higher density of population. But I've been thinking about those rural kids trying to have the connectivity. So uh, again, it's just another one of those trends, you know, and, and it all feeds into each other, but definitely we've been feeling that. Those hotspots are great to an extent. You still have to have the signal to run the hotspot. 100% Rebecca, and that's something that's top of mind for council. We talked about it in our visioning session too, and I know full well that it's a huge investment. It's not something we could ever, you know, totally invest in or pay for, but it's something that somehow we need to come up with different types of options and solutions and even in small ways to help support this community for sure. I have question, the question, this question is to the councillors. Um, I know that our mayor has been passionate about connectivity and access to internet and, and that sort of thing. And I was in a meeting, I can't remember the numbers, but I was absolutely staggered about, they were really working at trying to get internet happening, but the difference between the money that's available and what we actually need to actually um, have that connectivity is staggering. Is, is there a way that we as North Perth uh, Library Board could send a letter to council saying that we support council that just as continuing advocacy for what you're trying to do as a, a municipality? Matt? Thanks, Bernice. It, something that's uh, obviously big uh, on council's plate is connectivity and getting broadband internet service to a lot of rural com um, sections of the municipality. And yes, I do believe the figure, Leanne, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was like 24 or $28 million is what the fee was for actually getting everyone up to the 5010 limit. It was something, it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we're also in partnership with SWIFT, which is the Southwest Wardens Alliance to uh, try and get the broadband. Uh, the library board certainly could, but it is front and center because the municipality and your council knows of how important it is to get that connectivity that we want to get it. We certainly could send a letter, but it's already top of mind with the, to do everything that we can possibly get with grants and funding from the either the mm -hmm. provincial or the feds or something like that to get, and especially given our demographics, because you get some places that have 
higher speed internet, uh, which is a lot more um, geographically spread out than what we are in southwestern Ontario. We kind of seem to be in a bit of a dead spot here, so it is something that will cost an inordinate amount of money, but it's also something that we need uh, our provincial and federal partners to step forward and give us an assist with that. But we, it, it's certainly at the top of our list, or at least in a very short list at the top, to get that broadband connectivity yeah. to everything, or high speed of some description, to get the internet at least available. Uh, and it just comes down to, at this time, it comes down to just sheer dollars and cents, which unfortunately is just a staggering amount of money right now to get everyone up to speed. And the other quagmire that uh, uh, we're involved with right now is if you look at technology, <clears throat> case in point, that if you spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to get a technology that is deemed current today, uh, and then to find out that it's, you know, in different sectors or municipalities, you don't want something to be put, you want something that's going to have longevity and can be continued to be used. You don't want to be putting your money into something that all of a sudden in five years is going to be redundant or discontinued and a service is no longer provided. So you, you, that's just an absolute horrible hemorrhage of money. You don't want to spend millions of dollars and find out, oh, we're, we're not going with this hasn't been the conversation, but, oh, fiber is old school type of thing, like of all, and the way technology is changing, and that's the other thing that we have to keep, keep well in mind. But the board certainly could send in a letter, and I do agree with that, but I don't know if it's really necessary, as it's already at the top of the list and one of the major priorities for the municipality. No, yeah, I agree. Like, I, w um, I was thinking more, like, in the event that you need more assistance or just another voice I think would be great for the, the library to do it at some point but no not necessarily necessary now um, another question I have is the throne speech actually did say that broadband would be important how does that trickle down to us folks here Is yeah that's that's yet to be determined right and um, you know throne speeches don't give a lot of detail and um, Typically, sometimes they're speaking of projects that are already like in the works. So SWIFT is, you know, already part of partly in the works. And, you know, are they referencing that? I'm not sure. Um, you know, just cautiously optimistic that um, they will certainly continue to invest in in these kinds of services that we desperately need in, in these rural areas for sure. One of the concerns that I noted at the last council meeting was that uh, we had a public survey about the budget. And um, when the question was raised around internet connectivity, um, it didn't weigh very heavily amongst the public. And the unfortunately, the survey doesn't delineate between rural and urban customers or clients. And so we couldn't really tell whether that sentiment was based on urban folk who already have great internet or or not we couldn't tell so that was hard to hard to delineate and um certainly from you know the agricultural perspective i'm hearing it uh loud and clear screaming <laughs> that it's it's definitely such a a huge need out in these um rural areas but um, I'm not sure if that's felt the same way in town or in, in the urban areas. So, yeah. So I, I guess I, I, when, I, when I hear about this, I think in terms of uh, uh, private sector involvement, but I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I guess the reason why Whiteman, for example, wouldn't bury fiber optic cable in the rural areas would be because there's not enough customers to get payback with monthly fees. Is that as simple as that? For sure, I would think, because it costs an awful lot of money to run fiber lines, that if you look at, regardless if it's done yeah. underground, um, that if you look at, like, I'm trying to even think I'm dating myself, I think it was, when did Whiteman first come in and plumb Listowel uh, with fiber optic when it came in? Because all of a sudden, you've got meh, mediocre ED internet to go to super-duper high-speed fiber internet. We'll put it into your house, and you sign it on, you've got thousands of captive customers but yeah. if you look at 
how much it costs to run cable from, let's just say for the sake of easy mathematics from the new uh, recreation complex in town like the Steve Kerr, and say you had to run it, you know, five kilometers up the road, how many, how many customers are you going to get? Yeah. Um, and as far as like, they can subsidize it and try and get some assistance to do that. But as a private entity, at what point does the juice not worth the squeeze, so to speak? Like, if you look at like, oh, well, sure, we can we can do that, but at a significant cost. And that's where the significant cost and the multi millions of dollars in order to get everyone connected with the, the standard now, I do believe, is uh, 50 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload. That's what they're actually deeming as the sort of like one of the minimal benchmarks that they're looking for for the actual speed that they require. So, yeah, yeah and could, just like you said, John, it comes down to okay, Number well, if you could. Giving hydro service to an apartment building is totally different than giving hydro service to a farmhouse that's half a kilometer out the road. So it's a, it's a lot different. It's a lot different. Or not hydro service, internet service. Giving it mm -hmm. to an apartment building with 50 units in it is a lot yeah. different than running that cable for the same cable for one fifty dollar a month internet bill. Yeah, and you couldn't make it cost effective to, to even bite on that individually or just for the no. few. A few no. businesses, I guess. Too bad it couldn't be piggybacked onto some other, uh, you know, if somebody were getting new gas lines put in, which they are in Kincardine, for example, and some of the smaller communities up there, too bad it couldn't be piggybacked as they go through the counties uh, as far as burying the cable at the same time. But because uh, I guess that's the big cost, right? So but that doesn't happen all the time. So. Thanks, folks. I think we've we've covered a lot of ground in that discussion and I really appreciate council councillors that um, your work with with that because that's been something over the years that's been incredibly important and given what Rebecca's saying in terms of you know ebooks and Leanne ebooks and tech is is here to stay it's, it's a really important conversation to have is there any other final comments before we move on to the next um, item on the agenda Okay, if we'll move to other business. I'm really excited to hear about this. Rebecca, Moncton Branch Progress Update. I hope it's not anticlimactic after that. Um, I don't have an Oscar winning uh, video for you this time. Um, we are, we finished relocating the collection today. There's still some work to be done to, you know, sort of shift things around and make sure things are in the right, in the right spaces. But the shelves at the existing Moncton Library are completely empty, which is um, a big accomplishment for a small staff compliment. Um, and so we are preparing, staff are going to have tours and, and learn, you know, the, the health and safety ropes towards the end of this week. And then we will implement curbside first. Curbside and the book drop will start next week. And then the week following, we will start to take appointments so that people can come in. And, and our plan is to work that around when the building is currently busy. It might not be our permanent operating hours forever, but current usage of the facility based on, you know, the COVID life that we're living right now. And then uh, we will try and offer based on demand, but be flexible with our hours so that we can have more appointments for people to come in and see the space for the first few weeks, just so everyone who's curious can come through and have a, a look. And I did send out the, uh, an invitation for you as library board members to come through and have a look if you're interested. No pressure if it doesn't work with your schedule, but uh, just, just the courtesy invite for you to come. And I'm going to extend the same invitation to you the past members of the Moncton Branch Advisory Subcommittee so that those who spent all those hours around the table trying to come up with a solution for Moncton can have a look if they wish uh, to see what came to fruition and how it looks. Uh, I am really happy with the way that it looks. The space itself is just um, 
it's I don't know the energy in the space is really great it's just a bustling facility and it's great to see the kids coming and going and the families coming and going and um, there's a lot of trail usage which I wasn't really aware of so there's lots of people who are coming to that parking lot to jump on their bikes or or go for a walk or use that park or um, get their mail there was like five cars having a conversation at the mailbox today too so I think it's just a great space for us to be I'm I'm super excited for us to start offering service there. We have had a few delays um, with some of the shelving, but we have enough, or not shelving, pardon me, some of the furniture, but we do have enough in place to start the browsing appointments. We're not in a situation where people are going to sit in comfy chairs for lengths of time at this point anyway. So we do have some COVID delays until almost the end of the year for some of the things that we had on order. Um, but we're we're just it, we're just pushing along, and I am so excited to share it with those who want to come for a tour. And I think the community is just gonna love it. Any um, was was there much of a community response in terms of the old photos that you were looking for? Uh, no, we did not have a single photo submitted. Um, we did, there was someone, I think, I do believe that the archives did receive a donation of documents as a result of that call, um, but we did not receive historic images. We're going to leave that up. Um, I did make use of a historic image from the archives in the space, so there is already something there, and perhaps when people see that, they will, um, you know, be more inspired to share. It, if anything, it... it uh, was advocacy for the archives collection in terms of Moncton so that the Moncton community is aware that they would love to have some more documentation to Moncton's history, um, which I think is really important as we as we kind of go forward. And yeah, I, I have, uh, the great thing about working with the vendor that we worked with for the shelving is he, like the guy who puts it together is the guy who sells it to you. And so when he was in the space, he could see what I meant about other things. And um, we had some great conversations about some possibilities for those photos. Should they show up some, some creative ways to, to share them in the space. So we do have the space for it. If the community comes up with some other um, images to share. And, you know, once people are in the space, I think you're right. I think that'll probably trig, um, some people and then you'll, you'll probably get a response that way too. Thanks for that update. Any comments or questions for Rebecca about the Moncton branch? Okay. Then we'll move on to um, Terrence. I'm looking forward to a brief description about what you um, absorbed on September 24th, all six hours. <laughs> I, now, I don't know if Rebecca was part of it. Uh, Rebecca, were you part of the conference? No, she was no, I was not. Okay, well, on November 24th, there was a six-hour conference uh, put out by um, the Southern Ontario Library Association, and it dealt with a whole variety of topics. I was only for part of it. I could not stay for past the fourth hour, um, but I'll give you a brief outline of some of the things and a couple important things that are coming up that'll be part of the November 7th meeting. Um, they started out first by um, talking about uh, staffing and how staff how libraries have accommodated staff and how services have been rendered during this time. And they looked at all the different uh, formats people were using. Um, they talked about one thing that they were very concerned about was the reintegration of services and accessibility for everyone. That was a real concern um, because if you're providing curbside, you're not providing accessibility for everyone. And this is what the topic of conversation was about at times. They also had to talk about the provincial guidelines and municipal or um, regional guidelines, how they fit in with uh, openings of facilities. Uh, they went on, they talked about financial impacts. Are budgets going to be impacted? What were the financial impacts for library boards throughout the province? Um, and how were they how were they managing them? How were they handling them? Uh, were people experiencing uh, budget overruns? Were there clawbacks of budgets? Um, so these were all part of the discussion items. They also spent a lot of time talking about the e-library or the digital library and how important it's playing during this time. Um, at the same time, they were talking about uh, purchasing, continuing to purchase um, common resources to be shared by all libraries. Um, they also talked about the um, 
amalgamation, I don't want to use the word amalgamation, the consolidation of the Northern Ontario Library Association and the Southern Ontario Library Association into one association. And I got the impression that um, the COVID situation has kind of driven that the two groups uh, should begin to look to each other as one organization for the benef economic benefits of one larger organization. And I have a funny feeling on the November 7th meeting, that will be a major topic of discussion. I just got an email, I haven't opened it and read it, but it is about the amalgamation or the consolidation of the two library uh, organizations in Ontario. It also looked at some of the trends that are coming in libraries. Um, they also said, are we going to experience a change in attitudes towards libraries after we've gone through an extended period where libraries have operated in a different form. Um, they, um, oh, I'm just looking through all my notes here. Um, okay, staffing, uh, budget. Um, but there was a variety of different things. Uh, they were there was a lot of talk about the provincial guidelines and how they're working and are they have they been successful? Are our reopenings working within the guidelines? Um, so that was that was part of the four hours that I was um, part of the converse, not part of the conversation, but part of the listening conversation. If um, So those were the topics I was listening to. I have extensive notes on all those topics, but I've just given you a brief overview. As I said, I am doing the annual general meeting is a three hour meeting on November 7th, and it goes from nine till uh, 12. And I will be, um, l last year I attended it, this year I will be doing it online. And so we have our meeting on the 10th, so I'll be able to give you some follow up. And I do believe the one thing that is um, a big issue is the amalgamation of the two groups. So that gives you some ideas. Wow, you succinctly covered a lot of areas. That must have been interesting and a lot to absorb. It's always interesting because they bring in a lot of professionals. Uh, they bring in, um, well, I shouldn't just say professionals. The um, Solus uh, group, um, their people are, are experts in their own area, but they've, they often bring in lawyers and different people from other areas to explain the guidelines and the legal implications um, of different things to us as well. So it was, it was well worth it. It was just six hours and sitting in front of a, t um, a video screen for six hours is not that exciting. I'll, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> I could appreciate, well, we appreciate your heroic effort to be able to sit through a couple of hours with that. I, I can certainly appreciate that. But what I also really like in terms of us having a representative on Souls is that it's it it's inspiring because you see what other people are doing and it's it can be encouraging and offer other ideas that there's material. Maybe it won't be brought out immediately, but Terrence, maybe at the next one, you can say, hey, this is something that I learned. The and one thing... The one thing that would surprise, I think, most people is how positive. I, I, I've sat in on three meetings in the last couple months, and I've always, I'm always blown away how positive everyone is about what we are doing and how we're handling the situation. So I think that's um, a remarkable thing to see during this time. They see what we're achieving as a great deal of success within a framework that doesn't allow for a lot of success. So it's a very positive, um, lots of positive feedback. Concern though about, concern about um, Will there be clawbacks? Will there be reduced budgets? Um, will money, will the money that flows to libraries change in the future years? And, and some believe the trend could be the other way, more money because now they see how important the library system is during a time like this. Um, because they've also just talked about how um, there are limited, for many people with schools closed at a, uh, a period of time and many facilities closed, the libraries were their only source of information. And that, um, that, that's proven very important and um, maybe one of the reasons why libraries should be funded the way they are or should, be continued, should continue to increase funding because they've proven valuable. Wow, I can't say that there's a better way to f finish your discussion than a, a statement like that. I think, thank you very much for sharing that. That that was very, very interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions um, for Terrence in terms of the, uh, the uh, huge range of topics he touched on? No. So um, at this point, it looks like we've run through um, 
pretty well, well all of our agenda meetings. Our next uh, meeting will be Tuesday, November 10th. Uh, none of you have to be concerned about the driving. It is November, but um, so we'll be we'll meet then. At this point, um, is there someone that would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? Oh, Becky, adjourn and Shirley second it. I actually should say um, I want to say thank you one to our counselors because I know you've got a huge amount to deal with over the the um, uh, in the past since COVID started and. I can only imagine what your 2021 discussions are. I really appreciate your um, support for the library. Um, it, it, it means a lot to have people that are engaged and, and interested in, and, um, and supportive of the library going forward because I know there's going to be some tough decisions uh, going ahead. Rebecca, I also want to say thank you for um, including that article for trends of discussion. As I've said before, I do, um, you've got enough on your plate. You don't need to look for things for us. But when there is something like that that comes across, I think it, it initiated a very um, healthy discussion uh, for us as a board. Uh, and parents, I appreciate your extra work in terms of bringing forward some of the other things that other people are some doing. Sometimes in a meeting like this, we talk about what we're doing in our even though we're bigger than some, we're still doing something in our little area. So it was great to look beyond our borders for creativity and inspiration and, and as, as Taryn said, the positivity. So on that note, um, I would like to, um, we had a motion and a seconder. So all in favor for adjourning the meeting. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. It was wonderful to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Wonderful Thanks, to see you, and we'll see you on November 10th.